to record this. All right, so I put together this presentation last night kind of quick. It's just like uh, kind of like a template. For Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So um, I'm going to kind of run through it as quick as I can, and then um, you can ask questions throughout it, or you can wait to the end, whatever you want to do. So let me. Okay, sounds good. I'm sorry I'm being so needy. That's <laughs> all good. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, and don't worry, you don't have to really look at it because there's not a lot of detail in the slides. So I'll pretty much just talk. All right, have that. Okay. Okay. When this will I be able to look at this? Also, or is it going to be with my modules and stuff? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm recording it now. I'm gonna upload it to the onboarding thing, so you'll it'll probably be in like the other section. So, um, okay. Okay, so like I want to do kind of specific to shoulder since we're gonna kind of really get you going on the shoulder. So this is just like a lens okay. to look at the shoulder. Um, so you know you'll get maybe on a script like a medical diagnosis, but I kind of care a little more about like the clinical presentation and sort of the therapeutic ther diagnosis. So uh, so I'm gonna. Basically, when I evaluate a shoulder, I kind of look at it in sort of four buckets, right? So you either got like a hypermobile shoulder, a hypomobile, um, or what I would call more like a positional problem, or it's kind of like mixed, actually, it's kind of a combination of hypermobile and hypomobile, just uh, sort of specific muscle or weak and specific one type. That's probably the most common. And then sort of the, the fourth bucket, I would say, is more like neurologic, like a ridic radiculopathy or uh, maybe something coming from the spine or maybe like a thoracic outlet syndrome. So those are kind of the four groups I would put people in when I do my evaluation. So I'm going to kind of go through um, each one of those, not into great depth, but just, um, again, just like a general template. So a uh, hypermobile shoulder usually is someone who's just got generalized weakness uh, and probably most specifically to the rotator cuff and the scapular muscles. That's by far the most common. Um, you know, people work out in the gym, they focus on sort of the look good, feel good muscles, like the ones that look good on the beach, which are more your, so your like fast switch muscles like the deltoid and bicep and tricep. Um, not much emphasis is really placed on strengthening rotator cuff or scapular muscles, you know, unless you're working with a trainer knows the stuff like Chad. Um, right. So most, a lot of people, and particularly women, uh, for whatever reason, tend to fall into more of an instability issue, whereas guys tend to fall into more of a stiffness issue, but that's, that's very general. Uh, you can definitely have a big muscle-bound guy who presents with hypermobility and, you know, and vice versa. Um, but that's just general pattern. Uh, so one thing that can happen too, is the labrum can tear. So if you have any kind of labrum issues, so that the role of the labrum is to kind of deepen the socket. So just going back to the anatomy, the, the ball and socket joint of the shoulder, it's pretty small. Like, you know, it basically the socket is like the size of a mark, marker cap trying to hold on to like a tennis ball. Uh, so it's a very shallow yeah. socket. Uh, so the, the labrum creates more depth in the socket and it creates kind of a negative pressure. Um, so it's one of the layers of stability of the shoulder. So it's pretty common to have tears. Sometimes they just happens in life, just slow degeneration process. Sometimes it's more traumatic. Uh, but once that thing is torn, you're kind of losing some of that negative pressure and you tend to get a lot of uh, instability because of that, especially if you're already on the weak side. Um, so yeah, then there's tears, dislocation. Uh, so a rotator cuff tear. So rotator cuff, one of its main roles is kind of pull the humerus up into the socket. Um, that's, I think, its main role. And then it's also kind of like acts like the steering wheel for the shoulder. Um, so obviously, if you have a tearing rotator cuff, you're going to lose another layer of stability. And then there's people just get like frequent dislocations. I got a buddy on my hockey team. He's been dislocating the same shoulder for years. And he's, you know, because of that, he's developed a lot of tears in the rotator cuff, tears in his labrum. And, you know, so, uh, and he probably had generalized weakness for his whole life. Um, and then the other thing too, is that you can get like adaptive hypermobility. So like a lot of baseball pitchers look at this because they're constantly cranking their shoulder back so many times that the shoulder sort of adapts to that position and they get like excessive range of motion. So a lot of overhead sports, like, you know, volleyball players would get this too. So that's, that's generalized or that's hypermobility sort of in a nutshell there. 
right? So hypomobility, sort of the classic one is a frozen shoulder. Uh, then you got someone who's just generally stiff. Maybe the muscles are really stiff. You can get capsular stiffness. Now that's, you know, that's what frozen shoulder really is, that the, the, the adhesive capsulitis, the capsule sort of becomes in flames and it adheres down and creates severe stiffness. Uh, but you can also just have general capsular stiffness and not have frozen shoulder. Um, and you'll find like a lot of people tend to be stiff on the back and undersized, so the posterior and inferior part of the capsule. Um, and this is generally because of positions, like so if they're a desk worker, the shoulders are always sitting forward. So the, the back and underside of the capsule just develop stiffness because the balls are sort of forward in the socket. And of course, post-surgical, so rotator cuff repairs, capsule repairs, anything like that. If they're, they've been in the sling, they're, they're going to be stiff as hell. I saw one guy who actually had uh, fractured his clavicle and had a non-surgical uh, rehab. So they just put him in a sling for like something like two months. It was a long time. And this guy was like 38 or something like that. And he, uh, when he got out of that sling, he had probably like negative 50 degrees of external rotation. So he basically barely lift, barely lift his hand off the stomach. That's how stiff he was, just from being a sling. Uh, that's wow. yeah, so that's not post surgical, but you know, if you're in a sling for even like a week, you're gonna develop some serious stiffness. Okay. So that's hypomobility. So just before you um, too far, just in case. So um, one of the things that I'm kind of curious about is how, what you're kind of feeling for or doing to determine which of these things you're looking at, other than just the obvious knowledge. Um, that you have on what they look like. Are you doing anything in particular to kind of determine, um, you know, out of the different things that you're saying could be hypermobility and hypermobility? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, it's gonna come down to the objective measures, the evaluation. Um, so I, I generally okay. like look at just how they move. What's their overhead look like? Or what's a pushing motion or a pulling motion look like? Uh, you can get a quick sense of it that way. Uh, but then I'll do some strength testing and some range of motion motion testing. Um, that's going to give me most of my information, uh, especially the range of motion. So if you lay someone back on the table and then you like, especially like say external rotation, they're like a stiff old guy. You get like a lot of those like old golfers and you check out their external rotation and sitting at like 65 degrees right there. I'm thinking, all right, this, this guy's going to fall into that bucket of hypo mobility. Um, or you get like, maybe you get your 27 year old yoga instructor in here and she's got like 120 degrees of extra rotation. Um, like nineties kind of considered normal, but that's kind of, yeah. uh, like, well, you'll see, you know, see people, it's just like, they got massive extra rotation, especially if you get like what I was talking about, like, um, like an overhead athlete, like baseball officials will get like 150 degrees of extra rotation. It's crazy. Um, wow. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of it <laughs> down to the range of motion. And then I'm also going to assess the joint itself. I literally will take the humerus and kind of move it around in the socket, and see what it feels like. Um, okay. Yeah, and I usually will look at the non affected side first. Uh, I'll move it around and then get a feel for what their normal is and compare it to the, the sort of involved side. Uh, you know, once you've done like a handful of these okay. evaluations, too, you get a real feel for it. Oh, that's a loose socket. <laughs> yeah. You know, it is, it's definitely subjective, but, you know, that's where you start looking at patterns of presentation. Okay, they're having, you know, a lot of pain in these end ranges, and they're, maybe their shoulders tipping really forward you know, when they're bench pressing or something like that. Uh, it, it, okay. That looks a lot like an instability issue. All right, so, but probably by far, most people fall into this category here, this positional or mixed pattern. So that, what I mean by that is like, Picture your desk, Jack, because I'm working, you know, 40 hour work week, sitting at home or a desk, whatever. Um, they develop, I, I guess, you know, like kind of like upper cross is your classic where you're kind of stiff in the front. So like your maybe your pack, your lat is stiff. And then so the, the backside, the rotator cuff are weak. So that's where you get those rounded shoulders. Like the shoulder blades will really abduct away from the spine. One quick thing to look at is the the border of the scapula uh, in relation to the spine, usually it's supposed to be about two or so fingers you can fit in between that space. A lot of people be like four plus fingers. 
that to me is an immediate sign that, okay, we got someone who's like anterior dominant. The pack is just pulling everything forward and the, the, the uh, mid traps, the rhomboids, and all the scapular muscles are not pulling back enough. Um, that's like your classic presentation. Um, adaptive, same thing. Uh, that's just, your body adapts to whatever shape you're in, right? Um, I like to think of it as like your cells are always turning over like all day, every day, right? And yeah, depending on the stimulus you put into them, that's how they adapt. So if you're always in this like slumped over, rounded forward position at your desk over time, that you know, the must the cells that are regenerating your back, are like, oh, okay, we don't really need that, need those anymore, but we need more in the front. So that's just how you end up. <laughs> you know, that, that's why yeah. you adapt it. Um another clue is like, you know, if you just look at posture, posture to me is like a great indicator. I don't, like people kind of think posture is the problem. I think it's more of the symptom. So I, I like to think of posture as it clues you into things to look at. So when yeah. I look at somebody right away, I like that. yeah, yeah. So like I, I rarely work on on someone say like, hey, you need to fix your posture. I I just I <laughs> look at their posture. I say, okay, I need to look at this pack because because of their positioning. You know I mean, so uh, yeah. I, I just found that telling people to work on their posture doesn't really work. <laughs> so uh, so, but when I do, one of the first things that I look at is their posture. If their shoulders are protracted or rounded forward, that's this kind of classic sign of this upper cross. Um, if they're internally rotated, so you'll see that, like if you look at their hands, and this is most people, by the way, the hands kind of turn inward. Like think of like the big muscle guy at the gym, it's kind of a knuckle dragger, the hands are turned inward. <laughs> that's like classic pec stiffness, right? And you know, all, well, all the internal rotators. So. Uh, that's going to be like pec, collat, and subscapularis. Those are the three main internal rotators. So when I see that, I'm like, I'm going to look at pec, collat, and subscapularis. See how reacted there. It's going to probably be stiff. Um, I'm going to no start trademarking some of your catchphrases. <laughs> but not, that's not mine. Knuckle dragger, that's an old one. <laughs> uh, another pattern that's super common is lacking shoulder extension. And this shows up a lot in like a bench press or push up, like pain with bench press. Um, you're think of a bench press as the chest, uh, the barbell is coming down to your chest. You think about the humeral position; it's going into extension. Well, if you're missing extension, the shoulder is going to tip forward. So you'll, you'll push your humerus into the sort of the anterior compartment of the shoulder, and that's a pretty sensitive area, right? That's it's kind of like the hip flexor area. There's a lot of stuff there. There's, you know, the bicep is there. You got a lot of nerves, uh, blood vessels. So that's uh, a pretty vulnerable area. Um, so yeah, I, I almost always, if you if you get a bench press right here and it's having pain with bench pressing, I'm almost always looking at their extension. Um, and then kind of the why behind a lot of this is, well, it's either adaptive, like their lifestyle, you know, work, uh, or an imbalanced program. This is sort of classic for guys, right? So like. I'm like, I'll always ask, what does your program like look like? They're like, okay, I do a push day, a pull day, and a leg day. It's your kind of classic split. Like, okay, uh, so you're doing your back and your chest evenly, and everyone's like, oh yeah, I totally do it evenly. And then you ask them, like, okay, what's your bench day look like? Okay, do six sets of bench, three sets of decline, three sets of incline, and then cable flies. All right, and so what's your <laughs> back day look like? It's like three sets of rope, three sets of pull-ups. You know, so <laughs> although they think they're doing it, yeah. it's completely imbalanced. So I will almost always look at their programming because that's usually a huge culprit. All right. And then this is sort of like the weird, you know, other one. This is neurologic. So this is where you get, if you get numbness or tingling, that's definitely neurologic. Burning, shooting sensations, going down the arm. Um, it can be a little confusing because you can get sort of referred pain from rotator cuff laterally down kind of like in the deltoid area. That's specific yeah. to rotator cuff. Uh, but once it extends down to like the elbow or it's the hand, now we're thinking neurologic. <clears throat> um, so I will usually look at their neck. You know, I'll look at their range of motion, their neck, have them do some flexion, extension, side bending and rotation and see if any of the neck positioning changes anything if, like if they go into cervical extension it reproduces their arm pain and then they go into cervical flexion and the arm pain goes away all right then we're pretty sure it's coming from the spine uh, but then i'll look at thoracic outlet are you familiar with thoracic outlet not really okay. 
I mean, we, I know, I know, I don't know that I would say I would be able to necessarily just like assess it. Yeah. Like I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have went in and seen it and be like, oh, that's what that is. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple tests for it. I'll show you those. Um, like there's a hyperduction test. Basically, you would um, have them seated and you uh, feel their pulse, like the radial pulse. And then you extend their arm behind their back. And then you can play with positionings of their head, like put certain muscles on tension, like their scalenes and pecs. And if the pulse starts to go away, that's what, that's the sign of rest, Calvin, because you're getting okay. compression of the muscular system. So it, that will typically ha happen either at the scalenes uh, or at the pec. Those are the two main ones. So there's like some clavius, but that's rare. Um, and this can overlap a lot with positional stuff. So if you've got some instability, say you've got a torn labrum and the shoulder tends to um, move forward in the socket a lot, just that can cause, it's basically taking the humerus, pushing the brachial plexus into it, maybe a stiff back. Um, so a lot of times just correcting the position will fix the neurologic symptoms. Um, and then there's also like peripheral stuff that can happen. This is not necessarily shoulder, but there's other sites of compression. So, so when it comes to compression, it can happen to the spine, it can happen to the scalenes, it can happen to the pec, it can happen at the uh, coronary arteries. There's a whole bunch of different spots up and down the arm that can happen. Um, and that's a little bit beyond the scope of what I want to talk about in this presentation. So I put a link to, uh, there's a blog I wrote on it that goes into a lot of detail. And uh, okay. I don't want to put too much emphasis on it because it's pretty rare, some of these things. I mean, I did see a pernary artery syndrome recently. I'll get like one a year, you know, it's, it's not super common. Really? Yeah. Do you like the neurological stuff? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, one thing I'll say about neurologic too is if the pain is something you can touch, generally it's local. If it's like this diffuse pain, you're pressing on the area of the saying it hurts, but that doesn't hurt to touch. I'm thinking neurologic right there. That, that's not a rule, that's a general rule of thumb though. Yeah, but that's good to know. Those kinds of things are helpful. I feel like in an evaluation, especially when you're trying to just like pull things quickly yeah. <laughs> from your brain. Yeah, exactly. And that's just a, you know, kind of a just, quick rule of thumb. Yeah. So check out that blog whenever you get a chance. Cause it's kind of, oh, yeah, I will. you get to like have an appreciation for it. I actually just got my, um, my best friend started on your nutrition series. She's very, she was vegan and was like quit having a period and all this stuff and oh, um yeah. she started eating meat again and uh, she i don't know anyway i sent her over to that and she's been um following along with that and this other lady on it and she said she just didn't realize all of that yeah that, that'll be a little bit mind-blowing for her probably so good <laughs> i'll be interested to see what she thinks of it all right so now um, yeah, like okay. Sorry. Uh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. So how to explain it. Right. So um, now I'm going to give you like two models I use a lot. And sometimes I'm telling this to patients and sometimes it's just good for me to keep in my mind. It just depends on, you know, some patients want to know every little detail and some don't. So it just depends on how I want to use this. But this is just another model or template to kind of look at the whole system. So the I3 okay. model is called, uh, I think I probably showed you a video on this before. So it's kind of like a vicious cycle. Starts with something's incomplete, that's the I1. So something's missing, so that could be range of motion, right? So someone's hypomobile, so they're gonna fall into that, range of motion missing. Uh, someone's hypermobile, maybe missing strength. So something's missing, right? And that, that changes their mechanics, right? Over time and repetition, um, so say they're like missing some shoulder extension and they're doing a ton of bench pressing. Every time they do it, their shoulder tips forward and that's a little incidence. Those things add up and compile over time. Now you, you're falling into like injury. Now it hurts. Now you're like, okay, I'm out of commission. I have to do rehab because now this is creating pain. The pain will in turn go into incomplete. It'll basically change your mechanics even further. So now you've got compensation and then the cycle just keeps going and going. All right, that's the, the way I think of it, right? So our job is basically to break that cycle, remove the pain first and then restore stuff. So sort of the flip side of the coin is what to do about it. And I use this D2, R2. So we start off with desensitize, decongest, reperfuse, restore. So desensitize means going back to the pain, you know, make the 
try to resolve some of the symptoms. You know, that's our manual therapy for the most part. Even exercise, get some blood to the area, can generally desensitize it. Um, and decongest, reperfuse kind of go together. This is kind of getting into the lymphatic system. So uh, if you've got any kind of swelling going on, you want to decongest it. That's where we can use the Mark Pro. That's where uh, just active use of muscle in a non-painful way is going to help decongest the area. And then generally using the muscle is going to get uh, new blood to the area. So we say, you know, out with the garbage, in with the groceries. That's kind of what these two steps mean. Like you're basically using the muscle, pumping stuff, getting the bad fluid out, getting the new stuff in. And then restore is restore what's missing. So that could be, you know, your range of motion. It could be your strength or, you know, somebody in that mixed bucket. It's a combination. I really like this one because I feel like it's where it's going to be good for me to be able to mix, you know, a lot of like starting with the manual and the exercise and then moving into the limp stuff yep. and um, kind of tying it all together. I feel like it makes more sense with that. Yeah. And you'll see, and now I'm going to go into like generally what to do. And you can see a lot of the stuff looks pretty, pretty similar, right? So, so someone who's hypomobile. Oh, wait. Yeah. This is supposed to say hypermobile, so ignore that. Okay. Uh, so, so say this is hypermobile. So you want to desensitize what hurts. That's usually what I start off with. And I'll, you know, I, I try to get that even in the evaluation. I'll try to save like 10 minutes to just make the person feel a bit better. Um, so that's addressing a symptom. But of course, we have to get down to the root cause, and that's strengthening what's weak. That's almost always going to be the rotator cuff, the scapular muscles for sure. Uh, you might find some other things. You might find a weak tricep or a weak deltoid. So but generally that's, I kind of build from the inside out. All right, so pretend this at hypermobile. I totally yeah. got these backwards. <laughs> so this, <laughs> this was a hypo. I'll just, <laughs> all right. So someone's stiff, same thing. Desensitize them first, you know, maybe some scraping, cupping, whatever. And then you mobilize whatever's stiff. All right, so this should be stiff muscles. Uh, almost always it's gonna be pecs, subscapularis, lat. Um, those muscles I'd probably spend a lot of time on. And those are, tend to be the muscles that hurt as well. Sometimes that post your rotator cuff will hurt as well. And then the capsule, if you're in your evaluation and find the capsule stiff, then you'll be mobilizing that. Um, that's, do you remember doing those capsular molds and you kind of like grab the humerus, you traction out a little bit, you put putting downward pressure into the humerus? Yeah, that's and it. I did, I did uh, look and it, we, we are able to do that. Oh, cool. for sure. I know I told you I thought so, but I found the, yes, we are. Yeah, okay. Perfect, perfect. You just reminded me. Sorry to interrupt. All good. Uh, and then restore. So you're restoring the range of motion. Uh, so that's where it also comes down to evaluation. Maybe you find they're short on their flexion or missing some internal rotation. Uh, that's what you got to restore. And then again, strengthen what's weak. And that's going to look a lot like the hypermobile one, which is going to be rotator cuffs, scapular muscles, or whatever else you find is weak in the, the uh, evaluation. Uh, positional mixed, same thing, right? Desensitize, mobilize, restore. Uh, with these ones too, I'll find cueing is particularly important. So, um, and I would say that's true for all of them, all the categories of buckets, but particularly in this one. So maybe you fix their mechanics, well, you fix their range of motion and strength. Now you gotta have them do whatever that activity is and make sure they're doing it right. All right, neurologic, kind of the same thing, desensitize what hurts. Uh, but then you have to figure out where is the compression coming from, right? So say they're having a thoracic outlet and you find that their scalenes are the culprit. Well, you got to, you know, do some soft tissue work on the scalenes to get them to sort of calm down and maybe loosen up a bit, maybe some stretching of the scalenes. So it really depends on where the, the uh, compression is happening. Um, and then you're going to probably have to stabilize something, right? So say the scalenes are stiff usually something nearby is weak. So a lot of times for the neck in particular, like the deep neck flexors might be weak. A simple test you can do for that is a chin tuck with a head lift. You have someone just tuck their chin and they're in supine and they lift their head just like an inch off the table. If they can't hold it for like 30 seconds, that's a pretty weak neck. Most people are like shaking like crazy in five seconds. So what tends to happen is the neighboring muscles start to kick in and stiffen up and then they start to compress the nerve. So that, that's usually like the underlying culprit. And restore what's missing. They're kind of, kind of the same as all the other stuff. All right. Um, now, so I kind of want to sort of run through this kind of quickly. 
I don't put a whole lot of emphasis on these things because you, you might get these on a referral. Um, just kind of good to know some general patterns that go along with this. So I'll just go over some patterns. So first of all, with impingement, impingement is sort of like a junk term, just means something's pinching inside the shoulder. Um, by the way, impingement is normal, like your muscles are supposed to slide on things. <laughs> it's just, it gets to a point where maybe you're running out of space, like things have stiffened up to a point where now you've got uh, too much compressive force and now it's become irritable. Uh, and just know there's a internal and external impingement. So, uh, so that means inside or outside the capsule. So intra-articular or extra-articular. So uh, external impingements, well, probably one that most people know about, that's where something underneath the AC joints being compressed. So sometimes it's supraspinatus, sometimes it's the bursa, it's probably both. Um, classic sign of that is it hurts to go overhead. Pain with abduction in particular. That's your classic sign. Internal impingement is like the something inside the joints getting pressed. This happens a lot to uh, like overhead athletes. So this, like, like a pitcher, baseball pitcher is a classic example of this. As the arm goes back in sort of the cocking phase, that's where they tend to get uh, pain. So the way I usually differentiate the two is the location and the movement. So the location of external it's going to be location pain is going to be sort of lateral and in the deltoid area and pain with abduction. And then the ones that have internal are going to be more on the back side of the shoulder and more with like uh, end range external rotation. So those are that's how I differentiate those two. Bicep tendonitis. Um, biceps can get blamed a lot when you have pain in the front of the shoulder. It certainly can happen a lot to the bicep, but sometimes it's just compressive forces in the front of the shoulder. But if they're having pain in the front, I'll have them like do a resisted bicep curl. Like I'll use my own hands and say, resist me. And they're pretending like they're doing a bicep curl or I'll have them pretend like they're doing like an uppercut and give them some downward pressure on their, their fist, basically. And that'll re tease out if it's bicep. So in other words, I got pain in the front of the shoulder. I'll do those special tests like that. If they, I can reproduce it with those movements, I'm thinking bicep. If it doesn't reproduce it, I'm thinking it's more just anterior compression in general. Uh, okay, rotator cuff tears. How you doing on time, by the way? Oh, I'm I'm good. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're almost done here. I since, well, yeah. Since you said you were gonna be mostly talking, I just went ahead and drove all the way there. Yeah. I have to drive half of the day. So. <laughs> okay, no worries. Uh, uh, rotator cuff tears. These things are gonna be depending on severity. I mean, this can be a little harder to tease out. Um, there's good rule in tests, but not good rule out. So in other words, if you have someone who is like super painful and testing weak, particularly in rotation or abduction, that's a pretty strong sign of rotator cuff tear. But I've also seen people present like that and not have a tear. So this, this can be a little tricky. There's what's called lag tests. So there's like an uh, abduction lag test. So what this looks like, you have them seated, you put their arm to about 90, you're holding their arm at about 90 degrees of abduction. They say, I'm gonna let go of your arm, keep it there, right? If you let go and their arm drops like an inch or two, that's a lag sign. And that's a sign of a rotator cuff tear. Uh, but I've also seen people with full rotator cuff tear oh, tests. So just know that our special tests for this are not that good. Um, but I just wanted to get you kind of aware, of, you know, you'll like when you see it when they're like i can't lift my arm at all then you know that's a pretty strong sign to tear uh adhesive capsulitis that is frozen shoulder this uh there's actually new evidence that this might be an autoimmune issue um so what this will look like is they're missing a ton of range of motion and just notice different stages there's freezing frozen and thawed and don't worry too much about that but just the freezing stage is really painful frozen stage is like not that painful, but they're severely limited in the range of motion. So they're going to be missing kind of all the range of motion, but the classic pattern there is missing external rotation, abduction, and internal rotation, those three in particular. And they'll generally have like a shrug sign. If you have them go into flexion, like to reach for the kitchen cabinets, their entire upper track shrugs because they're just trying to get the arm up there. Um, and that's, that one's a pain in the butt. That could take like six months or a year. I mean, it can resolve on its own in about a year. We can speed it up, but that it does take a while. All right, labral tear is very common, especially with a foosh injury. Foosh means falling on outstretched hand. 
So uh, a lot of times the you, you fall and you raise yourself with the hand, your humerus rams up into the joint and just impacts the labrum that can tear it. Uh, by far the most common tear is a slap tear. So that means superior labrum, anterior to posterior. Um, don't worry so much about that. Just That's just the location. It's on the sort of top of the labrum and it goes it's an anterior posterior tear. Uh, this is usually gonna present with a lot of instability. Um, the, the ball will be able to pull anteriorly too easily. Um, there's a great test called the Job test that can kind of rule in and out between impingement and uh, a slap tear. Because those look a lot alike. You'll get a lot of common symptoms between the two, slap and impingement. So picture someone laying on the back, you bring their arm into abduction, they're like, ow, it hurts. Okay, if you put your hand on their shoulder and posterior glide them, and it reduces the pain, that's usually a sign that it's a slap tear. So now you're putting the ball in the socket. Now, when you let go, um, and it, it hurts again, okay, another sign of a slap tear. But if changing the head of the humerus, the position doesn't affect the pain at all, it just hurts regardless, that's usually more um, uh, rotator cuff impingement. Um, thoracic outlet, I kind of talked about already, and same thing with cervical radiculopathy. Um, I'll have to show you like hyperabduction tests, and then I can show you some in person, I'll show you a provocative testing uh, for cervical radiculopathy. There's one called a Sperling's test where you just have them side bend their head and you compress their head down into their spine. And if that reproduces it, that's very strong uh, cervical radic radiculopathy sign. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah, that was my last slide. Any questions so far? I know it was a lot and really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I will think of some. So you recorded this, so I'm probably going to go over it slowly and like kind of on myself, like reproduce what you're saying at the same time to kind of get a feel or, um, you know, maybe do a couple mock evaluations just so that I get the flow of doing it. Um, but no, I'm, I'm trying to think. I Really, I don't have a lot of questions. I think um, most of that's just going to be kind of like I said, I've been, you know, brushing up on all the terms and it'll help with your explanations. That's so good. I think it's just going to be getting my hands on people and starting to get experience, actually feeling what these things feel and look like. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have you practice a little bit on me as well. Um, I was going to tell you, yeah, that by, is by no means an exhaustive list. Those are just sort of the most common things that I see, especially in this clinic. Cool. All right. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and and the recording okay. here, and then just you know text or email if you think of any questions. Okay, I will. Do you have a patient now? In about seven minutes. Okay. All right. Well, I'll let you go then. Thanks for doing that. I really appreciate it. I um no I don't want you to feel like um anxious about me getting in there and doing anything. I just like I've said before, okay. I just want to make sure that I. <laughs> I'm doing a good job and not, um, you know, rubbing anybody the wrong way with, you know, your name attached to it. So uh, no worries. I know you'll do fine. Um, okay. Let me uh, end this recording here. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll upload this to the onboarding uh, portal. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. We'll chat later. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Bye.